months. So um, appreciate you guys joining. Here, here's the agenda for tonight. Um, so first off, we're again going to go through some deals that O Capital recently completed in Q4, just to give you an idea of sort of what what we're seeing in the market in terms of lending, in terms of um, financing, and then. We're going to get into the secondary markets. And so I asked the listing brokers to put together three or four slides on these markets um, throughout Texas. And we're going to really dive into those markets. But then also, um, I basically took your questions that you did um, when you registered. And I'm going to do sort of a quick fire uh, round of questions at the end of their session. So we're going to give them about 10 minutes to present. And then we're going to do um, five or 10 questions after that with each one of the brokers. And then we're going to go into the virtual networking at about eight o'clock. So, um, all right. So let's uh, jump right into here. All right. So here's here's a snapshot of the team here at Old Capital. Um, there's 11, 11 people here on the team. Um, most of us are here in Texas, but we have Clay Allen out in Atlanta and we have Julie Peterson out in California along with Dave Walls. And so the rest of the team here and um, if you want to say hi to Ryan Irvin, Ryan Irvin just joined us um, the past uh, at the beginning of the year. So um, he is here on the call. So if you want to give a shout out to him, that would be great. Uh, we will all be in the um, moderated uh, breakout rooms at eight o'clock for, for you to talk with us um, during those sessions as well. All right. Um, if you don't have been connected with us in these different ways, I would say number one, uh, make sure you subscribed up to the Old Capital Podcast. That's number one. Number two, um, in terms of the conference, uh, we haven't figured out if we're going to do that in person or virtual um, in 2021, but we will let you know. And then if you have not joined our Facebook group, uh, go on, click um, the Facebook group that will allow you to get updates on all the events that we're doing and all the um, latest happenings at Old Capital. So um, those are a couple ways to connect with us. And so let's go through a couple deals um, that we recently closed in the fourth quarter. Um, this was a portfolio deal over in Irving, South Irving, um, that Jeremy Thomason and um, his team put together. And it was a Fannie Mae transaction. So we did a 10-year Fannie Mae green loan at 75% on this transaction. Um, the Riata Ranch was a deal that we just completed. It was a Fannie Mae loan assumption plus supplemental uh, for Nick, Nick Espinat and Brad Abbott out in Abilene. Um, Julie just completed a um, Freddie SBL hybrid deal out in Springdale, Arkansas. Um, John Brixen here in Dallas. It was pretty large value add. I think it was like 10 to 15,000 a door in terms of rehab out in Grand Prairie. And we were able to get 75% loan to cost for uh, Raj Gutner, I believe on that deal. And then we also completed a bank loan. John Brixen completed a bank loan over in East Dallas on a fairly new construction townhome deal. Um, so that was a bank loan, I think, that we closed in less than 30 days um, right here in Dallas. Uh, Ricardo Hinosa closed uh, a good number of deals in Q4, and this was one of them, uh, Centerville Crossing over in Garland. 10-year um, Fannie Mae loan with three years IO. Um, and then also another deal, Freddie Mac SBL, over in Oakwood, uh, or Oakwood West in Enid, Oklahoma, at 75% LTV and two years IO. And then also to, to wrap up, New Orleans was a 68 unit deal that he completed, um, 10 year Freddie Mac SBL at 80% LTV. So um, those were some just some recent transactions. I think all those deals closed uh, just in the last month. And so we've been busy here at Old Capital, just uh, working on transactions from Fannie, Freddie, Bridge, non-recourse, recourse. recourse. Um, so I wanted to next bring on um, two guys from the multifamily group. Um, number one is John Krebs and Paul Yazbek. So if you guys, um, let me see, if you guys could unmute yourself, that would be great. Um, and then that will allow me to bring you up. Mic check. All right, there Chris, we go. do you have me, James, as well? We got Paul and we got John. Yeah, let me Perfect. see if I can uh, pull you up here. Okay. Um, so I, multifamily group, if um, maybe Paul, if you want to kick it off and just give us a little background on um, the group, and um, then we can um, jump into some of the markets here. 
Definitely. Uh, John and I started the company in January 2018. We were a national firm before that, top producers there, worked together since 2015, and we decided to open up our shop. And the picture you see on the right there, we've added a few more folks since then. We have about 15 people, uh, marketing, underwriter, and then like 12, like 13 brokers. So we're, we, we keep growing. We are in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, going to about to be in New Mexico a little bit more. And then new markets we look at this year, uh, Atlanta and probably Phoenix. So excited to keep growing with our clients um, and excited. And Paul and James, thanks for having us on tonight. Perfect. Um, so I think, I think we've got you up, Paul, first. Um, so we want to dive into Colleen. So um, maybe give us a little background, a little market dynamics on Colleen, and then jump into maybe give us some deal stories here. Um, for some of the deals you recently closed or on the market? Definitely, thanks, James. So our, our firm, myself, we've closed just over 1,900 units there. And the way, way I got involved with Colleen is I was an army captain at Fort Hood. And so historically Fort Hood, or Colleen is known for being the home of Fort Hood. And because of that, everyone thinks all these apartments have all this military presence and it's hard to get a loan or it's too volatile. And there are a few properties where sometimes they do have a high military concentration, but a lot of apartments, and, and I've owned down there since 2017, you may have five or 10% active duty military. Um, and, and the agencies only have issues if you're over 40. So most of these properties on here, in fact, all these properties on this list here, none of them have a concentration of military over probably 10, 15%, with the exception of country place. That was about 95%. And that owner loved having military at his, in his units. And those were nice two bedrooms, all two bedrooms, about a thousand bucks a month in rent. And that was nineties construction. But other than that, all the rest of these properties had very low military concentrations. Uh, and the military has helped that, that market kind of weather uh, economic storms, uh, the dirt, financial distress, but also it's more diversified. That Clean MSA is about 450,000 people. I think our next slide has the number but we've done 14 deals in Colleen. This is just a smattering of the ones we've done most recently. Um, unlike other markets, we've never actually closed a deal with a Sumrock or Lifestyles or Think or any other major syndicator. Typically it's high net worth individuals that either have owned in Colleen and want to add or have, have owned for a long time. Um, recently, back in 2017 is when Wainer, Wainer entered the market for management. Before that, you didn't have a lot of uh, larger management firms in market. And so that might have been part of the reason why some of the syndication groups weren't comfortable going down there. But now they're at about just under a thousand doors under management in Colleen. They've been doing it for uh, since 2017 in this market. Uh, I'd say a deal store that one, uh, Century Plaza did that in September 2017. That NOI was around 425. And I just sold that in February 2020 uh, on a loan assumption. Uh, and the, the NOI had popped to 925, actually 928. And that was from September, 2017 to February, 2020. So operators can go in there, reduce expenses, increase income, uh, different value add ideas. And it worked really well for that investor. And that was a hard deal to sell. We were the sec second brokerage firm to try to market that, sold it for uh, that owner out of Dallas. And then he flipped out, he sold out of it uh, mm -hmm. in February, 2020. So we've had a lot of clients, uh, the Colony, we'll, we'll, that one I'll be listing here later in the year for a client. He got that with collections of about 90K. He's now, now increasing. He's at 115 right now per month in collections. And that'll be a listing that our firm will work on probably late spring, early summer. It's been renamed since. Um, you still find some value add deals. Closed to Arbor's Edge uh, for like 26 a door, 50% occupied. That owner's going to go in with a big value add. Um, and, and it probably do, you know, five, 10 K a door. And he'll probably, uh, look to exit that at definitely double his, his purchase price in probably about two years. So, um, untouched, these properties don't trade hands as much as you would see in, in DFW or San Antonio or other larger markets. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to go in there and do those interior renovations, bump rents. Um, a lot of, we've seen a lot of, have a lot of clients that have success doing that. I've done on some of the properties I owned as well basically just doing like the Wayner interior upgrades and it's, it's worked out well for, for owners down there. Paul, can you give us maybe um, sort of rough, if uh, it looks like most of the stuff is sort of B and C class here, um, sort of rough pricing right now in this market? Yeah, well, when we first, our, so our average 
per, our contract price is about was about 36k a unit. Um, some that's skewed by some uh, lower value add one. Century traded for in February 2020 for like 59 a door. Uh, that's Century Plaza deal, and that was uh, that was built in the mid 60s. C class property, but I would say B amenities. Um, cap rates when we first started transaction and market in 2017 were closer to an eight for C class. And I would say now they're probably drop more to like a six and a half, six and a quarter. And then the value adds will go much lower than that if there's a you know a good, you know, obvious upside on them. Okay, good. Um, I guess that was sort of the map of Colleen and, and remind people sort of where Colleen sits in sort of the size of it again. Yeah, so we're, we're you know, Clean MSA, which includes Temple, Bel Belton, Copperas Co, is about 460,000 folks. So it's fairly large, uh, large geographic area. Fort Hood is the largest military base in the entire world. <clears throat> so if you're coming up I-35 from Austin, it's a, it's a little over an hour. And then you head west a little bit on, on 14. So if you're coming from Temple, it's about a 25 minute drive from Temple. Uh, Waco to Colleen is about an hour and a half. And okay. So it's right, right off 35, you know, 10 miles or so Perfect. to the West. Um, anything else on Colleen before we jump over to San Antonio? No, I would say it's, it's a market where I think it's, still, it's also benefiting from Austin's growth. You have people that will live in Colleen and commute down to you know, a round rock for work because of the housing affordability. There's been no deliveries of new product, which has helped uh, allow owners to boost rents is that the first bullet showing there. And, uh, so we we're always active in that market. If it's a market you want to learn more about, we're happy to uh, talk more. We have we only have that one deal right now, Liberty Landing, available, and we'll probably have another listing of that colony property here in probably three four months. So we like to uh, jokingly refer to you guys as the kings of Colleen. So um, appreciate you kicking it off here um, tonight. And um, let's go over to John. Are you there, uh, John Krebs? Let's uh, yep. pull up. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily, uh, call, usually we think of secondary markets as, you know, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, um, outside of big metros like Dallas or Houston, um, or even Austin and, you know, Colleen's, Colleen's probably what an hour or so north of hour and a half north of Austin. Um, but I wanted to highlight, um, San Antonio, uh, because you guys have done a lot of transactions down there. So, um, John, maybe um, I'll pass it over to you and maybe talk through a couple of these deals that you guys have closed recently in the last year and maybe are on the market. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, you know, these are all deals that we did just in, in 2020. Um, you know, a couple of them were marketed unsuccessfully and then we had one that was went under contract before COVID and then fell out and had to come back to the market with, um, you know, a lot of these deals have been owned by the same, um, uh, person for, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years. We got into the market down there in 2018 and just kind of saw it as being an underserved under brokered market. And, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's been really good for investors. We haven't seen a lot of, like Paul mentioned, you know, some of these deals come in full cycle and now taking some investors out. Um, right now we're doing that with, uh, with a property called uh, Glenwood that we sold last or in 2019. And now we're, it's back on the market. Um, you know, so some of these are, are first generation deals. Our, our firm's first time to sell them. It'll be interesting to see. I've, I've been paying uh, close attention to the Seven Pines property. Those The buyers have been really marketing the upgrades they're doing there, and they look really nice. Uh, excited to see that. That property was owned for 21 years before it changed hands back in October. John, can you maybe give people um, an idea sort of on, if you're looking at a map of San Antonio, sort of where these deals sit and sort of how maybe Northwest San Antonio versus Northeast or Southeast. Um, can you give people an idea of sort of demand drivers in this market? Yeah, you know, historically the Southern part of San Antonio has been kind of redlined by investors and they, they didn't want to go down there. We actually um, brought in a, a big um, 
owner operator out of Dallas that bought Utopia Place. Um, and then I, I mentioned Seven Pines. Yeah, as you get closer up to the Northwest is where the University of San Antonio, University of Texas at San Antonio is. Um, and, and the properties get a little bit nicer. Um, over on that Northeast side, they're, they're a little bit older, a little, you know, there's a lot of C-class property over there, but it's, but it's good areas. Um, you know, we always get a lot of activity uh, from investors over there. San Antonio, you know, it's a big city. Uh, it's got, you know, the land size is, is very large. It's got, you know, well over a million people. And there's, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of, of product there. I think, you know, more than people might realize. All right. Um, I'll flip over to this next slide. Maybe this will, maybe this is what I was alluding to. Um, maybe just touch on maybe these uh, nodes that you have highlighted here on your slide. Yeah, the one, you know, we, the last one that we sold was that Stone Oak place up in the Northwest side. And it's a great market, but this property just happened to be, you know, owned by some guys who'd had it for a long time and weren't really proactive about, you know, managing during the, the COVID pandemic. So it was actually in forbearance and their debt service coverage had dipped, you know, below, um, below one, you know, they weren't able to meet debt service. So we brought in an investor to assume that loan and, you know, they were really happy to get the deal at a good basis. And, and the seller, frankly, was happy to get out of it. But that market up there was, is really strong. You know, you see 18% rent growth and that's in the last, you know, five years. I think our, our information from Yardies was a little bit stale. It's probably even up more like, you know, 20, 21% since July 14. And that's, that's significant when you look at how that affects the, the cap rate uh, over on the West side, you know, we did a deal over there that, um, you know, was in very poor condition. Uh, it's actually not on this map. This oh, was, it's map. no, it's not on there. It's back in 20, 2018. Uh, but it was, it was rough. And, you know, now the uh, owner's coming in there and fixing it up. You can see that there's not a lot of occupancy. Uh, now this is for, um, I'm sorry, there's not a lot of uh, supply growth, you know, up in that Northwest side. And most of the supply is coming from A-class and that's where we saw some softness in the market. But, you know, in B and C, you know, there really hasn't been, you know, it, ha it had a little dip, but the rent growth has been pretty flat. You look at nationally, um, you know, rent growth has been down over the last year below, you know, below zero, but uh, there's even been some positive rent growth in, you know, B and C-class in San Antonio. Okay. Uh, let me see if I got, so maybe talk on deals on the market real quick um, here in San Antonio, John. Yeah. So, you know, executives a little bit smaller deal. It's, uh, you know, low, low sixties a door. It was, is uh, what we're whispering on that. It needs some, you know, lipstick. I mean, it's the exterior is tired. We've, we've, we've baked that into the pricing though. Glenwood is a, is a really clean deal. Very nice. It's kind of set back in a neighborhood. Um, that's the one I mentioned that we just uh, sold back in 2019. Um, Mission Villas has, has been hit a little bit harder uh, by COVID-19. Um, but it's, again, another, you know, basis play where you could pick it up in the low 60s a unit. And um, it's 176 units, have some scale down there. So, you know, if, if you want to talk with us about these deals, um, feel free to reach out. All right, perfect. Um, so I'm going to hit you guys with some, this is like the rapid fire round and see if you guys maybe uh, can take 30 seconds to a minute and just hit these real quick. All right. Um, so Daniel Kramer asked, um, how have secondary markets changed after COVID? Uh, Paul, you want to take that one? Sure. I would say in, in Colleen, I've, we've seen a few instances where people are doing the CDC order uh, to prevent eviction, but I would say by and large, People are maintaining their collections. The clients I have are still running over, you know, 90 to 90 hybrid occupancy and maybe just have a few tenants that are taking advantage of, uh, of COVID. But overall, I would say uh, not a huge impact. The, the, the Liberty Landing deal we did have listed, 
they have dropped down into the, like the high, set, I guess, low 80s occupancy. They've been hit a little bit, but they're smaller and they and they split a manager that's not always on site there. So I think that's more of a management issue than the actual market or COVID. Okay. Uh, let's see, Matt Stacy asks, uh, why do institutional investors typically not invest in secondary markets? Uh, John Krebs? You know, I think, I think there are institutional investors that, that do invest in secondary markets, but primarily they're looking for, you know, less risk. And so they're, they're willing to take less return by going into, you know, a market like even, I, you know, I've heard, you know, back 10, 12 years ago that Dallas, you know, wasn't even really considered a, a primary market. It was, it was mostly the coastal, you know, gateway cities like New York and Los Angeles Chicago, San Francisco. I think more institutional capital is looking certainly at Dallas Fort Worth and now, you know, San Antonio. Um, you know, we just listed a deal in Waco. There's certainly some, you know, institutional um, groups there. Um, so, you know, while there may not be a lot of institutional investors in Colleen, I think it pr provides an opportunity for investors. Uh, that are, you know, might be on this call to go in and, and take advantage of some opportunities. Okay, perfect. Uh, Salvador asks, what is the best way to access secondary market deals? Uh, Paul? I would say just talk with, you know, all the guys on this call, all work secondary markets throughout Texas. Just, I'd get in touch with any of the brokers on this call and get on their lists and, uh, some of these deals are listed. We, we tend to try to list off secondary market deals more because there is a smaller buyer pool than a primary market, uh, but there's definitely off market opportunities as well. So I would just uh, get in touch with the broker, uh, any of us and uh, probably help you out. Perfect. All right. Uh, Jared asks, okay, how can syndicators better approach brokers to add value to them in order to see their pocket listings? So maybe go back to Paul on that one. So let's say they know you and yep. 100 people reach out to you uh, from this call, but then how do they stand out? I guess is a better, better question. You, you know, I think, you know, for me and maybe some other guys as well is, you know, if it's, if it's your first deal or it's your third deal, just say, say what it is. Don't, I may puff what your experience is or what your experience isn't. Just, you know, just be upfront and honest. And then when, you, when we send you a deal, I would say, if you're going to give us, try to give us feedback on it. I, I didn't like it because of this. And we're trying to reach back out. I was just touring with someone in Albuquerque um, and they toured it last minute. I'm flown in, got to go out of my way to get the manager to agree to a tour. And they just kind of ghost you afterwards. So well, that's not someone I want to show more, more off market deals to, because I went out of my way to get you a tour uh, last minute. And then you didn't like it, but instead of just saying, I didn't like it because there's not as much value as you wanted or some other reason, you just kind of go silent. I'm probably not going to try to show you more deals. We just want feedback. I would say, on off-market listings. Then if you have a plan for, you know, if you have a, a reputable lender, uh, other ways you can be vetted. I think that always helps stand out. You know, here's who I'm working with on the lending side. Here's who I'm working with probably, I'll probably look at these one or two management companies, anything that can make you more credible because we would know, we know the people you're working with it always helps. So associated credibility is what you're saying. <laughs> always helps. Correct. Um, so we'll leave this one for the end, maybe. Uh, let's see. So George asked, uh, John, what are upcoming markets that haven't seen the spike in pricing yet, but have the fundamentals for it? George asked. Yeah, that's a great question, George. Uh, I think, and I've, I've seen you looking out there, you know, Oklahoma City is one market where I sold a property, Springs of Moore, it's a, you know, it's a good uh, sub market, good, you know, bedroom community of more outs just outside of Oklahoma city and sold it for 36,000 a unit, you know, and it had individual HVAC and, you know, it had some stuff going for it that, uh, that owner is definitely going to be able to make money with that, that property. So, you know, it's kind of starting to get pricey in San Antonio, maybe a year or two ago, I would have said that one. I still think it is, uh, you know, cheaper than, um, you know, Dallas and Houston. So the, I think there's opportunities there. Um, and then, you know, Paul mentioned Albuquerque. Um, he's wow. got, you know, uh, another property. We've got a couple of properties we're selling there. Um, I mentioned the, the, the listing in Waco, you know, I think there, 
they're all, you know, it's still specific, but there are some, you know, low basis deals out there for, um, for folks that are looking to add value and maybe take a little bit more risk going out to some of the secondary markets. Yeah, we did a low basis deal in Little Rock last summer and obviously clean. We traded below 30 a door last year as well. All right. Uh, let's, let's hit these last two. Um, I, I don't know how to say this person's first name, but uh, what metrics are not on most people's radar when selecting a secondary market? Uh, Paul? <laughs> hmm. You know, I would say just from yeah. the debt side, James, Yeah. you know, you can, um, you know, maybe, t- you know, educate people a little bit about how like Oklahoma City, um, you know, I know Matt's can talk about Amarillo, some of these markets are pre-review, so that may not be on people's radar that, you know, debt service leverage may be a little bit different in some of these markets. We look at a lot, a lot more bridge and bank loans, especially if, if you know, on these deals that are, um, you know, on the margin for occupancy, that, that's, that's one thing that comes to mind. Yeah. I think, I think what, um, on, on that point, I think you, on the lending side, you definitely have to, it's, it's market by market. And then it is also sort of what size, right? So Freddie Mac SBL is going to go up to a certain amount, but they're going to look at deals a little different than Fannie. So you're going to have to, even though you, you definitely need a mortgage broker in Dallas, you definitely, definitely need one in uh, secondary markets, because I think a lot of times it can change very quickly. And so you have to know sort of the appetite of Fannie and Freddie in that market. And we can sort of give you that um, a spreadsheet between the two um, on, on almost every deal. That's a great point, James. You did a debt quote for us in Albuquerque recently. That came back at 80% LTD, which blew my mind. It was higher than some of the markets like Colleen or San Angelo, or and we, you guys have warned us about Tulsa being lower as well. So I think Albuquerque seems more risky to me, but not to the agencies. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's not just a function of the industry, but sometimes it is um, how much exposure they have in that industry. And then if they have a large concentration of multifamily in that market, then they might just turn down that market, even though that market might be fine, right? But the agency debt that's available in that market just might not be there. So um, we'll wrap up with this one. Marco asks, how easy or hard is it to get a good property management company in the smaller markets? And Paul, you touched on this, but um, maybe talk about property management in these smaller markets. You, you know, I think, you know, if you can show a, uh, you know, a company that you're, that you're going to grow or, you know, if I talk to like Wayner, for example, wasn't clean in 2017 and now they have a thousand doors. Uh, Wayner is not in Lubbock. I have a client that works with them and they're going to be in Lubbock starting in April on 300 doors. So they're entering new markets. They weren't in Little Rock until last summer. Now they're in Little Rock. So if you, if you have a company you like and you're going to be a growing client, you can probably get a, a bigger management firm in there because a lot, you're right. A lot of these smaller markets do have smaller management firms. But I think if you reach out to these larger ones, they are looking to grow in these secondary markets because a lot of it is mom and pop or self-management right now. But you can get a larger firm into these secondary markets for sure. I've done it in three uh, not that long, not that long period of time. That is perfect. Uh, thank you guys for jumping on. If you guys can hang out for a little bit, um, we, we'll throw you in a breakout room um, at, at, at eight o'clock when we do, and uh, maybe answer some questions in there. That would that would be great. But I appreciate you guys coming on tonight. Yeah, they did a great job, uh, James. Th- thanks for having us here a little bit. Yep. So um, let's see. We got Bart. And Matt, if you guys could unmute yourself and uh, maybe just do a mic check and we'll we'll get you guys up here next. James, can you hear me? Hear me, James? Yep, I got one. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. There you go, Matt. I just wanted, I wanted to see you on the screen. Uh, I got <laughs> Matt and then, um, let's see, is Bart on? Bart's here. There you go. All right, I got you. All right, so... I'm gonna, um, whoever wants to kick it off, um, I pulled up this slide you see, uh, here on the transactions you guys have done recently. And I'll let you guys take it away, maybe do um, about 10 minutes on your presentation and then we'll get into the Q&A. Yeah, so this is Bart, James. First of all, thanks for having us. Um, you guys have just done a tremendous job with your debt shop over there. We are fortunate enough to 
close a deal with you guys as recently as Friday, um, a deal in Tyler, and it was not an easy deal to get done. And, and for all of you on the call, you know, you guys are coming to the right place for debt solutions. These guys are miracle workers sometimes and, and a, a great group to, to partner with, especially when it comes to the secondary markets. There's probably not a market on here that they haven't closed a deal, you know, in the last 12 months in. So um, thank you for, for having us. So uh, I'm with NKF in Dallas. We're a, a global um, real estate firm. Used to be ARA till we were purchased a couple of years ago. Um, we're a part of a bigger partnership in Dallas of um, seven brokers. Matt and I focus exclusively on the Texas secondary markets um, as well as New Mexico. Um, it's all I've done for the past 10 years. We've been very fortunate to be extremely active. You know, it's, it's amazing to me just in the last decade, the evolution of the Texas secondary markets, um, the amount of transaction volume we're seeing, the amount of investor interest we're seeing, and just, you know, how these markets have matured um, in the last 10 years really is, is nothing short of, of amazing. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons why people want to invest in the secondary markets. And it's, it's evidenced by, you know, the fundamentals and the strength and the transaction volume we're seeing um, really in every single one of these markets. You know, some years you might have a hot market like, you know, Colleen. The next year it might be Midland and Odessa that's seeing a ton of volume. The next year it might be uh, Longview and Tyler. But, you know, with any of these markets, you're going to see transaction volume. And I think one of the, the fears that investors had that really I don't think is warranted anymore is, okay, what if I buy this deal? The fundamentals of the market look good. The deal looks good. What's my exit? You know, who's going to buy this? And, you know, the reality is, is although you don't have quite the buyer pool that you do in Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, Houston, Austin, um, it's significant enough that almost in every uh, listing we have, you know, there, there's a market for that deal. And it's not just one or two buyers, you know, it's 10 buyers, it's 20 buyers. And, and at the same time, though, what's great is, you know, the institutions, um, you know, the big guys who really bid down deals have deep pockets, you know, although sometimes they will invest in these markets, it leaves the opportunities for, you know, some of the people starting out or just building their portfolio of deals to be able to be competitive in assets and is really a great place to, to start off your, your quest to building a multifamily portfolio because you can buy deals um, and the, the metrics and fundamentals are, are really good. Um, so just looking at this, this slide here, you know, we're active in all of these markets, you know, in Midland and Odessa, just in 2019, months it's been 30 million um but what we've seen drop off in the oil and gas market like midland and odessa you know we've seen an uptick on you know tyler and longview um you know even during covid the heart of covid we sold a couple longview deals couple tyler deals um and the reality is and this kind of goes back to that that other question you know the the pandemic I think has been treated a little different. They didn't have the evidence of cases uh, in some of these smaller markets. And so, you know, it didn't see the volatility um, and maybe some of the rent or occupancy decline that you saw in some of the primary markets. So um, anyways, we, we work primarily in North Texas, although we do cover the, the whole state. And um, that's about it. All right, so maybe uh, maybe we're going to deep dive a little bit here on East Texas. So um, I pulled up the slide on Tyler and Longview. So maybe give us your your snapshot of those two markets. Yeah, so I really like both of these markets for a lot of reasons. It's hard to highlight all the reasons. I mean, one of the one of the best things about it is you can jump in your car and you can be from downtown Dallas to downtown Tyler and 
almost about the same time it takes you to drive from Dallas to Fort Worth during rush hour. Um, you know, Tyler, Texas on the I-20 corridor, it's a very white collar town, very diversified uh, economic drivers, a ton of medical in both Tyler and Longview. A lot of people um, retire out east. You know, they have lake houses, they golf, what have you. And so, um, you know, it's just a good, strong market that has great occupancy, 95%. I mean, that's, that's better than most of the primary markets in, in Texas, much less the country. Um, good, solid rent growth. Um, unemployment is, you know, 6.4%, which is high. A lot of that's driven by COVID. But, but I think what you'll see in a lot of these markets that we're talking about tonight you know, unemployment rate is, is a lot lower than that of the, the primary market. So, you know, there's over 12,000 units in Tyler. And, you know, I bet you see 10 deals a year um, that trade in that market. And so it's, it's highly sought after. It's on a lot of people's radar screens because of the proximity to Dallas. You can you know, go check out your property, do what you need to do and be back in, in DFW you know, before dinner time um, makes that highly appealing. Um, you know, Longview, very similar, a little bit bigger MSA, but less apartments, surprisingly enough. Um, Longview used to have a lot more dependency on oil and gas, um, specifically the Haynesville Shale that sits east of Longview. Um, coincidentally, Jerry Jones just made a a billion plus dollar play and buying up a bunch of acreage out there. He thinks it's the next big shale play. Um, but, but since the, the oil declines in 2015, that market's really diversified itself. You have several universities. You've got, um, again, a lot of medical there. And that's reflected in, in strong occupancy, um, strong rent growth. And, you know, I think the, the multifamily group touched on this. You know, one of the one of the really exciting things about any secondary market in Texas, um, specifically Tyler Longview, is that, you know, the value add programs that you've seen played out, you know, two and three times already on a deal in Dallas, um, they haven't been touched in Tyler Longview and, you know, these other Texas secondary markets. So owners can come in and take a classic unit that, you know, is, is a nice unit, but hasn't had, you know, the quote unquote waner upgrade or any upgrade. And we've seen time and time again, that owner operators have been able to um, implement a value add, do it pretty inexpensively and see, you know, rent increases that are on par with, with that of the major markets. And it's really pushed NOIs, it's pushed values um, and owners have, have been doing extremely well uh, in these markets and, and East Texas is, is no different. Bart, I'll jump in there. I, I, one of the deals we sold last year in Tyler had harvest gold toilet bowls. So, you know, that just goes to show that it was built that way and they thought that looked good back then, but it doesn't look good now. And that was a huge value add. The other thing I think is worth pointing out on these is, you know, you, you may not think that Apple's tracking you, but all y'all with Apple smartphones, Apple's, uh, this is their mobility data on, on the bottom there. And you can see these markets perform tremendously well. This is, this is them tracking the activity of people moving about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And in Smith County and both grade County, it shot up. I mean, people started living their lives and acting like this, this global pandemic didn't even happen. And we saw it in the marketplace when we were selling deals. Perfect. Um, I guess, Matt, we'll jump over to you and, and touch on Amarillo then. Sure, Amarillo by morning. Uh, great, great George Strait song. But no, uh, very, very good market. Uh, that MSA population is actually over 300,000 today with the new census that's going to come out. So Amarillo is a very large market. And there's about 15,000 units there. The thing that, that you'll see in all these secondary markets, and Amarillo's no exception, is there's very little supply in the market. And so the Class A product that has been built, that's, that's you know, uh, may be 10 years old now, uh, is still getting three, $400 more in rent, maybe a thousand dollar rent. Uh, whereas the B and C product is 600, 
you know, so there is a huge gap between the class A space and the B and C space. And so the value add program is working uh, and, and investors are able to capitalize on that. And, and that's why you'll see good rate growth in these markets and opportunities to, to employ this. And Amarillo has been a great performer uh, during the global pandemic. It's a very diversified market. I call it a recession resilient type market. The unemployment rate is only 4.9% when I think Texas is closer to, to eight uh, and US is around six. So it just goes to show a market like Amarillo has performed really, really well. Uh, and that's reflected in the mobility data as well that we pulled from Apple, just seeing how many people are getting out and driving around and acting like the world is not coming to an end. Uh, in markets like these, you see people tend to just live their lives uh, where, where you go down the street in a major market like Dallas today, and people won't look at you, they're afraid they'll catch something. So that's just the, the world we live in. And, and so with that, we do have a deal out there, James, thanks for showing that, is the Enclave. It's 225 doors, 1972 construction, 946 average square foot units. When they bought this, there was a lot of distress on this property. Uh, and they've since put about $2 million into it. They implemented the a value add program, kind of two tiers, a, a full upgrade and a partial upgrade. And the full upgrade is getting as much as $145 on a turn, which you may not think that would happen in a place like Amarillo, but it is. Uh, and they, they've demonstrated this. And so... This one's out on the market right now. I'll be out there on Friday doing, doing tours. It's right off 40. You've probably driven by it if you've ever driven through Amarillo. Um, it's called the Enclave. And if you want to go tour it, let us know. Perfect. Um, all right. So I think, Paul, did you have a, a question real quick that you want to jump on? Never quick, James. Never <laughs> quick. Good evening to everybody. Again, I'm Paul Peebles. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the things that uh, I want to maybe bring out that maybe we haven't answered for you is, is really the why. why. Why the secondary markets? Why that's important? Um, and so I'm going to kind of ask James that question. Um, why is it important now? I mean, really, what's going on in the economy that I think that everybody's aware of but uh, why, why is secondary market so important? And again, it doesn't make a difference if we're, tonight we're focusing on Texas. This could be Wisconsin. This could be Pennsylvania. This could be Ohio. So but what's the important right now of the secondary markets, James? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a couple of things that have happened. Um, one, I would, I would start with just sort of yields in general um, in terms of interest rates on your savings account going down. Um, cap rates going down everywhere. And then um, a culmination of that plus um, sort of what COVID has done for technology, right? And what we're able to do and where people can work and whether they're working from home or working from um, the office two days a week, people have decided that they're okay spacing out a little bit in terms of they don't need to be on top of each other. And so we would have usually been 300 or 400 deep at, uh, in a big room right now, uh, but we're not. And so uh, the technology has allowed us to, everyone can sort of zoom in from wherever they are. And that has allowed people to um, work from anywhere, but also live anywhere. And so that um, has culminated in um, investor search for yield, uh, where people want to live, and then, also, um, I had one more thing, but I think that's that, those were the two big things for me in terms no, of search for yield and work from home. Yeah, I certainly do agree agree with that. Is that you know we've we've seen a change of where people can work, just like James had said. If you were living up in San Francisco or the Bay Area, now you can live any place you want because you're not necessarily tied to a desk. And so, if you want to move to Lawton, Oklahoma, and be close to your parents and work out of your house with uh, great Wi-Fi and uh, T1 lines or whatever, however you get your, your internet, you can certainly, you can certainly do that. Um, one of the things that I do want to bring to, we, we talked a little bit about Tyler and I saw that Lane Bean was in our conversation. Uh, Bart had made it, made a uh, disclosure to everybody that we closed the loan for Lane and his crew out in Tyler, Texas, just last week. And uh, you know, Lane is a, is a good operator. If we can pull Lane on here, if that's possible. Elaine, if you can turn your, your camera on or your microphone on, uh, you live in Dallas, but why would you explore out in Tyler? Why would you make a position in Tyler? 
I think you asked me, Paul, can you ask that again? You said, why do we go to Tyler? Yeah. Why did you, why did you make a position in Tyler? Why did you, why, why were you exploring Tyler? Again, Tyler is about 90 minutes east of Dallas. It's a nice community. It's like hometown USA, uh, but it's not a central business district of like Philadelphia or, or Austin or some of these larger towns. Why would you go out into that secondary or tertiary market? Yeah, and it's exactly what has already been said. Uh, the yield was better, the basis was better, and I felt like we were able to get a good value for the property that we acquired. Um, there's still, for the value that we were able to get, we were able to still increase our um, value add strategy a percentage the same. So I, I, th I thought that was why, and it's been, it's been iterated several times. The value in, in the smaller uh, markets uh, still exist. What due diligence did you do on a small town that you probably wouldn't have had to have done in a larger town? Right. We, we, we really went into the market. We studied uh, exactly what our tenant base was going to be, um, what type of, um, absorbency was going to be there, what was the supply and demand of the housing market in that area, and what was the demographics of the particular sub-market that we were investing in. So we, I think we did a little bit more due diligence in Tyler than we would have done in the primary markets because the primary markets, there's a lot of assumptions because they're so we're so familiar with them. And I wasn't as familiar with the Tyler market. So we studied the market stronger. So I think that's an additional thing that you have to look at is what is your employment base in these some of these small markets. If you take a look at uh, an area uh, close to the northern part of Arkansas, uh, Salem Springs up that way, uh, we did a loan up there a number of years ago, and uh, we had a problem because we had a concentration of employment, which means we had too many people in the town that worked for the same employer. So think of north uh, northwest Arkansas. What's the big employer in Northwest Arkansas? Walmart. Well, it would be Walmart, wouldn't it? But it wasn't. It was Tyson's Chicken. So ticket, uh, chicken rendering plants that take pieces, the big takes a big chicken and makes it into pieces. So that's a, something you have to, to figure out too, is what's your concentration level of students? What's your concentration level of one employer? What happens if that employer goes out of business? What's your, your concentration level like in Killeen? just like Paul had mentioned, uh, how much military are you exposed to? So if there is a base that's gonna be closed, what kind of an impact possibly in the future is that gonna have on your property? So there's additional due diligence that you have to do. And also last thing I wanna maybe bring up is these guys that we have on are the best of the best in the secondary and tertiary markets. If you walk into an office like uh, Marcus and Millichap, you're not going to hit, not all those guys are experts in secondary tertiary markets. If you walk into Matt's office over a new mark or in with Bart, you'll find that out of 10 guys, there's only two guys and, the, and, and you have those on, on tonight, Bart and, and uh, Matt, you have to find those guys, whether you're looking for properties in Philadelphia or in Florida or in, in Nevada. These are specialists. These are specialists in the marketplace itself. So they're not going to be focused on the central business district of Dallas or Austin or San Antonio. They're, they're typically focused on these secondary and tertiary markets. They're the ones making the calls to these, these places that are you know 90 minutes away or 100, 150 miles away from the central business district. So if you're in other areas that you're looking for, find guys just like Matt and Bart and Paul and the rest of the guys on what, ask them what their specialty is. So without any further ado, James, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, the, third, the third leg of the stool that I forgot was affordability. And you know, a lot of people come to Texas for affordability out of these high cost areas. And you know, the rent in Dallas has uh, continually gone up. The rent in Austin continues to go up, but secondary markets, I mean, I pulled up the slide here. I mean, the, the average rent in these markets in Amarillo is 761, 816, 950, right? So all under a thousand dollar average rent in these markets. So that last piece would, I would say is affordability. 
Um, so Matt and Bart, we're going to hit you with a couple of quick fire questions here and uh, let's see if we can knock these out. So Greg, Greg asked, um, what do you think the cap rate spread between secondary and primary markets is? Um, so I would say in general, you're looking at, and it depends on the market. Like you could go, if you've got the stomach for some potential volatility and the oil and gas markets like Midland and Odessa, you can buy true seven caps today, um, which, you know, that's 300 basis points over, you know, what we're seeing in, in Dallas. And, you know, I was talking to just some guys in Austin, they hadn't seen anything without a three handle in front of it in over 18 months. So, um, but that being said, you know, depending on the market, on average, maybe 50 to 75 basis points, you know, that deal that we're selling in uh, Amarillo out of the gate, true cap rate is a five and a quarter with, with upside. I think if you plop, plop that deal down in the mid cities, you know, it's, it's likely a low four. Um, so, you know, at a minimum 50 basis points, you know, and as high as 300, if, if you're, if you're looking in, you know, some of the counter cyclical markets. And then Bart, let me ask you a question real quick here too. Uh, Greg Shockey's in the oil and gas business. Uh, how about the guys that bought the, out in Midland Odessa three years ago when gas was at $110 a barrel, how are they doing today with the employment? How are things going out in the Midland uh, Odessa oil patch? <laughs> Well, you know, the, the nice thing for those guys is they put so much money in their pockets over the last three years that they were smart with it. They're, they're doing just fine. Um, but if you bought at the peak, you know, who anticipated COVID, right? Who anticipated uh, oil prices going negative? Um, you know, we have an administration change and, and there could be some impacts there. So, you know, the future certainly is unknown, but um, you know, like any market, if you buy a good piece of real estate and you do it um, wisely with good debt, good partners, a good operating plan, you know, you may not hit a home run right now, but 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 they're doing okay. All right, um, let me jump over to the next question. Aaron Kelso asks, uh, pro, pros and cons, maybe hit uh, biggest pro, biggest con, I said, I guess, if investing in a secondary market. Matt. Yeah, well, I, I think from the pro side, it's it's frankly a better risk adjusted return from what I see. Strategy seems to be more, uh, you, uh, you can do it, uh, where a lot of guys go in, they say, hey, I'm going to raise rent, you know, to make a deal work in Dallas, got to raise rent $300. Well, you don't have to do that in these type of markets. So you can hit your business plan, you can achieve your goals. Uh, and so I think the pros, pros are very good risk adjusted returns. The 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 con side would, and I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but it's just finding the right management company. You know, management companies is one of the biggest issues in a lot of these markets. So if you're talking to us, uh, make sure to, to ask, you know, any of the brokers, what's a good management company that I should be looking at this property with? Because uh, I think that can make a huge difference. Great point. Okay. I think we hit the stats. Um, I guess David um, asked, what are market conditions short run versus long run? Um, Bart, maybe I'll take maybe 12 month forecast versus five year forecast for some of these secondary markets. Well, I mean, I think just in general, investing in the great state of Texas makes sense. You know, there's, there's employment growth, job growth, there's a diversification of industry, there's, um, you know, there's net in migration. I mean, people are moving here. So, so short term and long term, I, I like investing in Texas, very business friendly. Um, you know, in the next 12 months, you know, the hope is obviously COVID gets put in the rear view mirror and everybody can, can look forward to, you know, a resumption back to normal. I think a new normal may be different. Um, you know, I read the other day that the Fed thinks that they're going to keep rates, you know, extremely low at or near zero for the next couple years. So, you know, as long as interest rates remain low and there's a low cost of capital, I think you're going to continue to see real good growth in multifamily specifically. Um, but then I think you'll, you'll still see, you know, a good amount of transaction volume. So I, I think it's, I think it's probably better in the long run than short run because we still have, you know, a little bit of, of uh, 
you know, a roadblock in front of us getting through this COVID thing. But, but at the end of the day, I think it's still very, very good. That's perfect. Um, Yasutomo asks, uh, which secondary market is in Texas is best to invest in for a first time investor? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I would say any of them are going to be a great option. Just like Bart said, invest in the great state of Texas makes sense. The meta narrative on Texas uh, applies to these secondary markets. Uh, however, we'd probably be biased to the ones that are closest to uh, Dallas. If you're a first timer, uh, just getting out to those markets is a little bit easier that way. Um, you know, you can go to an Amarillo and that can make a ton of sense. You know, it's just a 45 minute plane ride on Southwest. So it's no, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, but, you know, some of these markets can be a little bit tougher if you're going to go, uh, you know, to Pecos, Texas. You know, it's a really hard to get to. There's not an airport nearby, uh, but there's still deals to be done there and there's still opportunity if, if you can see it. So I, I think just making sure it's a, it's a market you can get in and out of as a first timer. I think that makes the most sense. Perfect. Um, Brandon asked, while the Dallas population has increased dramatically, how has that translated to secondary markets? Well, you've seen you've seen growth throughout most all uh, Texas secondary markets, albeit may, maybe not quite as fast as what you've seen in Dallas. But but you also see the the urban sprawl. You know, Waxahachie, Granbury, Midlothian, Forney, Terrell. You know, even Sherman, Denison. You know, back in the day, these were secondary and tertiary markets, and with the growth of DFW you know, it's almost a part of the Metroplex. So, you know, secondary markets are still seeing population growth. You know, one of the, I guess, maybe to piggyback on why invest in secondary markets, you know, take Midland and Odessa out of it, but you don't have the volatility. You don't have quite the, the ups, but certainly not the downs that we might see in primary markets. And, you know, it's a it's an old cliche, slow and steady wins the race. Well, I'd argue it's not slow in these markets. You know, it's still pretty speedy, but you don't see that that up and down. And so, um, you know, a lot of that is because, you know, you don't see people just abandoning jobs in the city and, and moving to other states, you know, quite as much in some of these towns. I mean, they're rooted there. Their families are there. You know, you don't have the, the transient type of population that you might see in some of the major metroplexes. So uh, although we've seen very nice population uh, increases through most of these markets, you know, it's, it's going to be slower and, and steadier. But part of the real benefit, and we talked about this earlier, is the threat of new supply hitting a market or a submarket that can just absolutely kill a submarket, which we've seen time and time again. And in certain pockets in Dallas, that just doesn't happen um, out there. And in, in any of the markets that you touched on today, is there any new supply or no? Well, yeah. I mean, when I say new supply, you know, it may be one, two deals a year, three, 600 units, maybe 900. But, you know, it's not the thousands and thousands of units that you might see um, you know, in different submarkets and some of the major metroplexes. So you, you still have supply because the rents are good and there's growth and there's reasons to develop, but you don't see, you know, 10 deals being built overnight within a mile of one another. Right. All right. Um, Kapil asks, um, how do you expect offer terms in terms of hard money, due diligence? Um, are they different in 2021 or what, what do you expect uh, let's say on, on your deals, what are you expecting people to put together um, for your secondary market listings? Yeah, I would just say generally uh, terms are a little bit lighter, especially on the time period, just because it takes longer to get out there. But frankly, what we've seen, and Bart, you can test to this, uh, we've seen terms that are very much in line with the primary markets. I mean, it's not a whole lot different when you have the same buyer and seller pool of, that's that's in the operating in these other markets, working in these secondary markets. It's not uncommon to see hard money immediately upon contract execution, uh, earnest money, uh, you know, being one to 2% of the, of the deal, a due diligence time for, frame that, you know, may not be 60 days, maybe 45 days at, at, when it's all said and done. So uh, generally speaking, they, the, the terms are a little looser. However, we haven't really seen that on the deals that we've been tra transacting on. All right. Um, and this, this is sort of like turning, turning the typical question around is, what qualities 
should an investor look for in a broker that they are considering using on a deal? Um, so it's sort of a turnaround on the typical question of what the investor should do. What should they look for in a broker, which I thought was pretty interesting. So um, maybe Bart, if you want to take that one. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, first and foremost, honesty, integrity, you want to be working with somebody that you can trust, right? Um, you need somebody who's competent, somebody who, you know, is no offense. We all have to start somewhere, but you know, it, it, it's good if they have a couple skins on the wall and have been around and truly do understand the marketplace and the market. So, you know, uh, I think trust, um, honesty, um, competency, and then probably lastly, just somebody who's going to, somebody who is going to pay you attention. Um, you know, look, we're all busy and it's a great market to be working in and we get pulled in a million different directions, but, you know, I try, I know Matt tries, and, and I'm sure the other brokers on this call, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, we're among the more successful brokers is because, you know, we really try to pay attention to each and every person. And if we don't, uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you say, hey, you know, Bart, I left you a voicemail two days ago. I haven't heard back from you. I would feel bad if that were the case. So don't hesitate to, to call again and say, hey, I'm following up on this. All right. That's perfect. Well, I appreciate you guys jumping on tonight. And um, if you guys can hang out for a little bit, we'll do a little virtual networking um, right after this last group. A lot so of people appreciate. want to talk to you guys. Yep. Yep. We'll hang. All right. Perfect. Um, so Sean, uh, Scott, Matt Aslan, if you guys want to unmute um, and put your video on, that would be great. And we will move over to you guys. Uh, I see Matt. Uh, is Sean on hey. yet? Hey, James. All right. I am you, here. Okay. There you go. Perfect. All right. So we will, hey James, uh, yeah. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yeah. You're good to go, Matt. Um, so I'll, I'll swing it over to you guys and um, let you take it away. So uh, we'll maybe start on your slides and then we'll hit the uh, quick fire questions. Okay. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, first up, uh, you know, just some deal history for our team. Uh, you know, I would say before we, we really formally had a secondary markets group, uh, you know, still had a, a number of secondary markets transactions that uh, the Fuel and Hoover team here at Marcus and Millichap has done. Um, but as you can see here, uh, it, you know, that, that number has really increased significantly since uh, Matt, myself, and, and we've got a, a few other guys on the team uh, have really started, you know, focusing on these markets over the last several years. Um, you know, so uh, amongst our group of, uh, I guess, 12 brokers overall at M&M, uh, you know, we've got, uh, what, six of us now, Matt, that are focused, uh, you know, exclusively on secondary markets. Um, and so that's, you know, really helping us to uh, increase the volume and, and ultimately, uh, you know, hopefully uh, helping investors to uh, realize a lot of opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's a little bit different about our secondary markets team versus the primary team is, uh, you know, we really do work across asset classes, you know, where I think uh, Markston Millichap is known in DFW for really mostly B and C class. Uh, you know, we work on A class deals uh, as well. In fact, if you uh, see this one here behind me, uh, you know, in the background, that's one I sold last year in Waco, uh, A class deal, 2014 construction, um, you know, and, uh, and really, um, a pretty awesome asset. Um, you know, and, and I think, uh, one of the other things that's kind of interesting about the secondary markets too, uh, is that you can find some A-class deals that are, are ultimately really value add that, uh, I think that's a lot harder to do in uh, a primary market like the FW. So, uh, you know, here you can see a, a few deals we've done recently, uh, over the course of the last few months. Uh, closed deals in New Mexico and Texas in Oklahoma. Uh, we've done some work out in uh, Louisiana as well, and, and we're starting to focus uh, a little more. We've got uh, somebody working hard on Arkansas. So, uh, you know, definitely trying to cover all the neighboring states uh, pretty well. And, and once we've, you know, got Texas and, and the neighboring states covered, well, then we can uh, move on to Philadelphia and the other markets that Paul likes. That's perfect. Um, if you want to jump over, I think the first one we're going to cover is Waco. 
Yeah, so uh, you know, Waco is is really one of my favorite secondary markets in Texas. Um, there's a lot of reasons that I like it. You know, I, I would say one is uh, excellent population growth. You know, you can see there uh, grew by about 10,000 residents last year. Um, I think that works out to nearly four percent. Uh, so extremely fast growth. In fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that would make it the second fastest growing city in Texas behind Austin. So, you know, to the question earlier, do we see, you know, big growth in, in any of these secondary markets? Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, as a percentage, Waco grew a little bit faster than DFW did last year. Um, average increase, you know, really high shows a strong economy there. Um, you know, at about 5%, that's, uh, that's a fantastic number. But not only do you have uh, great wage growth, you have a very diversified economy in Waco. And so I think that's another huge advantage. Um, I would say, you know, probably a lot of the investors out there uh, have heard about Waco because of the show Fixer Upper, because of Chip and Joanna Gaines um, and Magnolia Market. Mm. Certainly that has become a huge attraction uh, for Waco. And in fact, uh, my understanding is that for uh, folks vacationing alone, Waco is the number two uh, vacation destination in America, just behind Hawaii, um, which seems crazy to me. Why, why would we be comparing Waco, Texas and Hawaii? <laughs> uh, but that's, that's why. So tourism is certainly uh, big there, but you can uh, see that list of, of industries all very strong education, you know, over 30,000 students uh, in the market, uh, but spread across, uh, you know, a variety of, of uh, schools. Uh, TSTC, uh, I think, being kind of a hidden gem, uh, it shares its campus with uh, L3 Harris, which you can see down there in the uh, aerospace and defense category. Um, so it is a, a shorter term college, just two years, but most of the people who attend that college uh, are not uh, necessarily just local Waco residents, they are moving there to go to that college uh, to get a specialized degree that will help them move directly into the uh, aerospace and defense industry. Um, logistics is huge. Uh, Amazon just announced uh, there with uh, Governor Abbott uh, that they're opening a major new facility. They are now going to uh, match Walmart in terms of uh, employment in the area. Uh, and actually, Army and Air Force uh, use it as a, a pretty major logistics facility as well. Healthcare, got some great options there. Uh, advanced manufacturing is a big deal. You know, Waco is a market where you can find a lot of highly educated people uh, who are able to take on those jobs, uh, but still have a low cost of living. So ultimately can do it at a, a pretty low uh, total basis. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons that that's taken off. We talked about tourism and, and aerospace and um, defense, I think is pretty interesting too. Uh, you know, SpaceX has uh, their facility in McGregor. Pretty much all their uh, employees live in Waco. And that facility is, is where they've developed the uh, Falcon uh, heavy rockets, uh, among others. So, you know, that work is being done there. Uh, also, interestingly, uh, L3 Harris. Another project uh, I saw in the news recently, they um, uh, actually developed the specialized Boeing plane uh, that is now used by Virgin Galactic for their space launches. So, you know, Waco is, is really carving out a nice niche there. Um, and one other just, you know, interesting win, uh, apparently uh, one of the largest uh, manufacturers of uh, tile grout uh, in the world. Um, uh, Usen Utz, a German company, is uh, now opening their largest U.S. facility there. Uh, that's where they're going to handle all training. There's going to be over a thousand people there. So uh, again, you know, just another great uh, thing that's happening in Waco. All right. Um, let me see. I think Matt, did you have uh, a couple slides here? I think on Beaumont, and then we'll get to yeah. some of the deals on the market. Sure. So um, first off, Beaumont, um, very excited to have, have a few deals that, that'll hit the market here uh, shortly. But uh, Beaumont, if you don't know, it's in southeast Texas, um, 84 miles east of Houston and um, just north of the of Port Arthur. Um, you know, there's, you know, just a you know, tremendous business climate in that in that particular area, particularly uh, wanted to point out the um, 
the, the port of Beaumont. So uh, it's just, it's very active and, and kind of when it's, uh, if you include the uh, Port, Ar uh, port Arthur, Orange and Port of Be Beaumont, it's called the Golden Triangle. Uh, and that's responsible for, uh, you, you know, tremendous trade. And, uh, you know, especially with, with a lot of uh, countries as well. So um, just, you know, really strong economy from that standpoint. Um, population um, in that in Jefferson County, uh, Beaumont, MSA is uh, over 255,000. Median age, 35. Uh, median household income, 48,000 plus. Um, you know, I, you know, one thing I'd like to mention is just, you know, the, the you know, population growth. Uh, it's nothing major, but uh, about a 1.3% uh, year, year over year. So just a super steady uh, market as well. Um, I did want to point out just a few other, um, you know, economic drivers here. So obviously your hospitals, uh, there's several that, that, uh, that are there as well. Beaumont is also in a downtown Beaumont. Uh, their, their cultural arts district is, um, it's, it's booming. Um, there's actually six current museums that are in downtown uh, Beaumont. And uh, in fact, there, there's been a, a project approved for over 17 million. Uh, the first portion of that 5.9 was just funded. And so it's continuing to grow. Um, it's, it's also creating a lot of jobs as well. Um, obviously, being in that Southeast Texas, Exxon Mobil, um, a few other um, employers as well. Um, you know, Lamar University is, is, is probably another staple as well. So pretty diverse um, economic drivers for Beaumont. All right. Um, maybe touch on some deals that you guys have um, either have on your contract or coming out on the market here um, in these markets. Matt, you want to? Hit on Century Tree and, and Aspens first. Yeah, so uh, these two deals, it, it's a portfolio, uh, 50 units combined. Uh, we've had them on the market for um, about a month or so. We launched at early December, so holidays kind of slowed us down a little bit. But yeah, uh, still on the market. Um, you know, we're, we're accepting offers as, as they come, so we're, we're whispering uh, low two millions. Um, but happy to to discuss further. Um, also, you can download. The marketing packages for, for any of these deals and, and any of our current listings on multifamilyadvisors.com. All right. Yep. Uh, Thanks. And uh, yeah, the Madison, uh, another great property we got on the market right now. So that one's uh, in Waco, uh, right in the downtown area. Really, really cool property. Uh, you know, really an, an A class property. Um, built originally in 1923, totally rebuilt in 2019. So uh, entirely new steel support structure, all new uh, electrical, plumbing, windows, doors, unit interiors, et cetera. You know, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that you can actually find a real value add deal uh, in uh, even an A-class deal in, in some of these secondary markets. And so, uh, you know, I look at this one, this is one where really their one bed, one bath rents in particular are well below market. And so, uh, you know, basically there's a ton of loss to lease to burn off. So I think there's some great upside through management on this deal. Um, so really fantastic property and, and good looking property, you know, New York style. Uh, we've got a couple of properties, as, as you can see down below, uh, under contract right now in Waco. Those uh, should be closing here in the next two to three weeks, both of them. Uh, you know, another in Lubbock. And then uh, you can see off to the right, several properties coming to market soon. Uh, you know, a couple in uh, Amarillo, the one in Pampa, that's uh, a little bit northeast of Amarillo, uh, and so on. And, and then also we've got uh, some land that I think is uh, ripe for development uh, that's on the market as well. They're in uh, Crescent, which is a little southwest of Fort Worth, uh, as well as in Sherman, uh, up north of Dallas. All right. So now it is time for... Um the quick fire round for you guys. So um, John Floor asks, um, how have cap rates changed and what's your forward looking view on cap rates? Yeah, I would say, you know, cap rates uh, in the secondary markets have, have probably compressed uh, at least at the rate that they have in uh, the primary markets. You know, I, I would echo what Bart said earlier about the, uh, you know, spread that we typically see. Uh, I think that remains true, but I, I think that, you know, taking that forward-looking view, 
we're expecting cap rates to compress a little further, uh, especially as uh, interest rates have dropped and those rates seem to be staying low. And so uh, I think secondary markets are going to lag the primaries just a little bit. Uh, but I think forward looking, yeah, we're, we're going to see the cap rates actually move further down. All right. Ravi asks, um, what factors make a secondary market a good one for multifamily? Matt? Yeah, I'm, I'll jump in You know, for this. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we've mentioned this uh, at least several times in different ways on this call, but, um, you know, definitely looking for, for the, the good economic drivers. Um, you know, you definitely want to, uh, you know, each deal is going to be just a little bit different as well. Um, you know, I mean, you know, take one, for example, Sweetwater, Texas, uh, it's west of Abilene. Um, and Abilene is about a two and a half hour drive west of, of Dallas, right? And so um, I was looking at a, a 22 unit deal there. And so Sweetwater, there's, it is absolutely a tertiary market, <laughs> under, you know, 8,000, um, you know, population. Um, but uh, on this particular deal, it, it was, you know, 80s product had not been renovated. And uh, basically there was just, uh, you know, they, they got it at a really low price point per door, you know, probably low thirties and, uh, you know, on the back end, um, you know, just saw sold, uh, you know, for, for high sixties the door. And so, um, I would say, you know, definitely look at the opportunity for each deal, but in, in regards to the factors, it's definitely good to look at the economic drivers. Um, and, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Michael asks, uh, why do you think secondary is better than primary? John? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to say it's uh, just because of the amazing brokers. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's entirely it. Um, you know, the, what I like about the secondary markets, uh, going back to what Lane and others said, is uh, I think you have an opportunity for better yields, uh, especially day one. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think, and, and again, to echo what Bart and others have said, uh, you know, this is Texas. Texas is... Uh, as a whole, a fantastic place to invest. And so I think you're also going to get the kind of appreciation that uh, much of the country can only dream of. Um, and so it's really a, a pretty killer combo that I, I just don't think you see in a, a primary market. All right. Um, so Paul asks, what are common mistakes investors who are used to primary markets make when moving to secondary markets? So I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, I think I, I think the biggest mistake w would probably be with uh, management. And um, you know, there's a, there's a deal that that we were, we've been working last year. It happens to be in Nacogdoches, and um, you know, this particular ownership group uh, has historically been in primary markets, but they found an opportunity in Nacogdoches. They they came in, and in the last two years of ownership, I mean. They've switched management companies uh, three times, and uh, they're finally with you know good good management. I, I feel like they got finally got good boots on the ground to where um, here in the last eight months through COVID they they, they were struggling to be at seventy five percent occupancy, but now they're finally at ninety five percent. So um, I would probably say that's the number one mistake. All right, uh, Prashan S. I think we've hit on COVID. Um, yeah. Maybe uh, talk about sort of first half, I guess the deal flow looks pretty good. So maybe talk about this last one uh, or number seven, Steve S, uh, cap rates. And then I guess how are buyers underwriting sort of exit caps in secondary markets? You know, on primary markets, mm -hmm. you know, you might do 50 basis points over five years. Um, are you seeing people sort of use a larger gap in exit cap rates? What are you seeing? Yeah, I would say uh, it, probably most commonly it's uh, it's 75 to 100 basis points is what they're assuming on the exit caps. Um, you know, again, I touched on it earlier, but my expectation is we are going to see cap rates drop in the secondary markets. Um, I think again, you know, we're seeing uh, at DFW. You know, I've I've heard uh, of the A class deals in, in DFW occasionally trading under a four. You know. Now I've heard of the the first couple B class, you know, that have traded uh, at sub four caps, and so I think as we see those uh, DFW and and possibly even Austin, 
uh, Houston, you know, cap rates dropping, that we're going to see the same thing come in these secondary and tertiary markets. So, uh, it, yes, underwriting a, a change there and, and probably a little bit bigger one, but I think that's what the future holds. All right. Uh, well, I appreciate you guys jumping on. If you guys can hang out for a little